And today's topic is historical air photo orthomosaicing and applications. So just a quick overview of what we'll be covering today. We'll be looking at uh, historical air photo correction, why now? So I'd like to present to you the case for correcting your historical photography today, why it makes more sense uh, than ever. Um, then I'd like to spend some time to show you some of the offerings that we have, both uh, the software offerings and also the turnkey service offering that we are introducing within Canada and the U.S. and is also available um, in other countries uh, potentially. The other thing I want to talk about is uh, data dissemination tips. So uh, just uh, some experience that we've had in terms of taking your imagery that you've corrected and disseminating that out to your um, audience, whether that's your internal audience or an external audience through uh, web mapping services. And then I'd like to finish off with uh, some uh, discussion on applications and business cases. And of course, we'll leave it open for questions and answers at the end. So if you are uh, if you have some specific questions about what we're showing today, then by all means, uh, please uh, go ahead and do so at any time. So we do have uh, people monitoring the webinar. So if you have a question in the middle of the session, you can type in your questions in the panel. And uh, so uh, just quickly introduce myself. So my name is Kevin. I've been with PCI for uh, about nine years now, and my background is in GIS and remote sensing. So I'll be your presenter and host for today. And just uh, uh, some logistics. The lines are going to be muted during the presentation, so you can keep working, or if you're several people inside one room, you can talk. Uh, it's not going to disrupt the presentation. Type your questions in the questions panel. Raise your hand if you have a problem, or if you'd like to speak in the Q&A session, we can unmute your line if, uh, if you so desire. And we are recording this webinar, and we will be providing a link once we're done the presentation. All right. So the first thing I would like to ask is, presumably if you're here, it's because you are either um, in possession of a historical air photo archive or would like to create one. So I'm going to ask you a very simple question, which is, um, how large is your historical air photo uh, collection at the moment. So um, we've certainly seen uh, all different sizes, uh, depending on whether you're working at the city level or at the county level or at the provincial or federal level. Uh, definitely there are, are lots of different sizes of archives out there. Typically for an air photo survey that's been collected over a city, for example, the city of Ottawa or the city of Toronto, um, at, at a scale of about 15,000, you're looking at about sort of 200 photos or so to collect the uh, the entire uh, data set uh, or the, the entire city. And then, of course, there are multiple years in which the historical imagery has been collected because that is the foundation for all of the mapping that has been done over the years is the historical air photos. So I'm going to leave that open just for a couple more seconds. It looks like um, the, almost the majority of people have voted. So I'm just going to count down three, two, one, and I'm going to close the poll. And uh, I'll just share the results with you. So looks like uh, quite a few people have a small uh, number of collections, and then there's a few uh, that have 10,000 or more. So just, just some of the results there for, for you to get a sense of other people who are attending this webinar and how big their archives are. So um, the actual uh, content of the webinar now is, uh, is, is essentially, um, we, we, I'd like to discuss how the timing to be to create a digital GIS ready archive of your historical air photos just couldn't be better. The timing is now. There's several trends and several factors that we believe uh, make this possible. The number one trend is the cost of storage. So previously the cost of storing a single gigabyte of data, if you go all the way back to sort of the beginning of uh, personal computers in the 1980s, um, you're looking at, you know, 
crazy amounts of dollars per gigabyte, you know, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars, and that price has just been steadily decreasing and decreasing to the point where now we're looking at fractions of, of a cent to store a single gigabyte of data in in today's uh, dollars. Now, if we look at um, the cost to store all of that data on disk. Um, let's take, for example, the National Air Photo Library here in, in Ottawa, Canada. They possess roughly 6 million air photos. About 90% of those are uh, paper. And, uh, and so if they were to scan all of those at 800 DPI, a single channel for panchromatic, that's roughly 51 megabytes per image. So if you look at the cost of storing all of those images over time, it's just gone down and down. So basically not possible in 1980s, still not really possible in 1990s, maybe possible in the 2000s. But today, obviously, we're just looking at uh, a ridiculously low amount of money to store that many photos, given the cost of data storage. Some other trends um, where I think really the timing couldn't be better is that data dissemination is easier than it's ever been. And that's kind of due to several uh several things that have that have occurred over the last few years. The first one I would say is the ease of implementing a web service or a web map. Um, it used to be that implementing a web map was uh, kind of slow, kind of complicated. You needed a lot of developers to be able to sort of, you know, write tools from scratch to be able to take geospatial data and translate it in a format that a web browser would be able to consume that information in, in, a, in a, an effective manner. Um, but both open source and commercial tools have really come a long way. You'll recognize here some uh, some open source tools, Leaflet, uh, sort of a, 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 a freemium model, which is Mapbox, and then a commercial model, which is Esri. So all of those tools, depending on your level of ability, uh, whether you're a developer or if you just want to use a graphical user interface to publish your content, they make it pretty easy to do so. The other key thing is uh, the Open Geospatial Consortium has created standards for publishing data on the web. So here we have the web mapping standard, WMS, WFS, which is web feature service, and then the web coverage service. So all of these standards are, uh, they make it possible for uh, data to be published in, in a consistent way and for data to move across different sort of software platforms much more easily than ever before. The other key thing is on the consuming side, so on consuming those tiles or consuming those maps, the speed of uh, internet has just been going up and up and up. So here we see just in the last 10 years, sort of the average residential bandwidth in 2007 at about four megabits per second. And, in, and today in the US, it's up to 20 megabits per second almost. So these factors really make it easy to publish in a standard way and to consume web maps uh, and, and have a much more pleasant experience. Now, another key thing that we believe is critical is just the possibility of losing the national record, the heritage that is contained in the historical air photos. These are unique records of what was there in the landscape. Yes, topographic maps have been created from the air photos, but those are an interpretation of the content in the air photo itself. So the physical storage is expensive and the deterioration is absolutely inevitable. So on the left, we see a few sample archives or storage facilities that probably the most sophisticated one is on the left. It's from the uh, government of British Columbia. They store their uh, photos. It looks like a very uh, sophisticated facility that can't be inexpensive to keep that kind of facility uh, staffed and, and climate controlled and humidity and all of those things to ensure that the uh, air photos do not get damaged over time. Uh, on the top, we see more of a uh, sort of an improvised storage, so literally just photos sitting on somebody's shelf in an office. And on the bottom, we see the actual uh, film canisters that are stored in a, in a facility in the U.S. And we can see that on the right, what can happen over time is these uh, photos can get scratched. So if people handle them, if they mark them up, um, if you're going to scan that photo and make a digital record of it down the road, the more time goes on, the lower the quality it's going to be and the diff more difficult it's going to be to extract the information. 
Another key trend, obviously, is the fact that automation with software, it makes it economical and possible to correct large volumes of data. We are dealing with large volumes of imagery here. Just the Canadian Archive, as I mentioned, 6 million air photos, and that's just a lot, a lot of imagery to be processing. And so doing that in a manual method is obviously going to be very time consuming. So we've developed historical air photo processing workflows, which are available on a commercial basis through our software offering, but it's also the software that we use to offer a service to process the imagery for our clients. So we'll go through that now and we'll show you the difference between uh, the, two, the two different uh, items which I've just presented. So as I mentioned, our offering is twofold. We have the software, it's a customized solution that we've developed to automate the process of correcting the historical imagery. So this is out of the box solution. Typically, customers who purchase this software need to have resources on staff to, to train up, to learn how to use the software. They need some basic skills in terms of photogrammetry or image processing, and they need to invest some time to be able to understand how to use the software to get the best possible results. On the right-hand side, what PCI has decided to do is to offer services to help you to get there faster. So if you don't have the resources available or you don't want to invest the time to train up because maybe your archive isn't that big or you just don't see the value in learning that particular piece of software, you'd rather focus on sort of more GIS operations and feature extraction and higher end value information extraction from the imagery, then you can definitely hire us to do, to do the processing for you. So essentially what we'll be doing is using the commercial software, uh, but because we are the makers of the software, then we have the ability to improve it. And uh, uh, really also we have the, the benefit of having a lot of experienced people in our company who are experts in using this software. And those are the people that would be providing the service. So just a quick overview of the actual software workflow. So we have created this innovative multi-pass image alignment workflow. It goes back for probably about four or five years now. We introduced this into the marketplace. And what we, what we saw is a need to develop a specific workflow to handle difficult images. And of course, air photos are difficult images. They don't come with any geo-referencing. They have fiducial marks. They they, they're just difficult to work with and difficult to bring into a GIS environment to be able to layer on top of other information. So what we did is we developed this workflow. We take the original scans or we can, we can come to your facility and scan them for you if that's required. We prepare the data, we ingest it, we do a course alignment. So we, we roughly align the photos then we refine the alignment, we get it within the accuracy requirement that you uh, are interested in getting, and then we can generate final products such as orthos, mosaics, and also elevation products, which I'll be showing in a minute. Just going through some of the initial steps. So this is an example of the scanned air photos which have been ingested into the software. And here we can see all of the markings on the air photos are still present. And what we've done is we've taken the approximate scene center for every image and we've geo-referenced the images to roughly where they belong. And what you see in the background is a reference layer that we use to collect ground control points automatically. So here we just have an initial alignment, which is within 200 meters of the reference layer. What we then do is we collect GCPs or ground control points and tie points, and we build a block bundle model. And we also take into account the camera that was used to use the camera model to remove distortions from the lens and to project the images onto the ground using an elevation model and, and what we see here are the ortho images. So here, if we were to look at the alignment between these individual orthos, we would have very strong alignment and across the entire block of data because all of the images have been corrected as a single block of data. So it's a block bundle adjusted model that takes into account the control points that we've provided, the tie points, and also the camera model that we've applied 
to remove the distortions and get the best possible accuracy. Based on the orthos, we can automatically mosaic. So here what you see is all of those individual orthos have been mosaiced into a single image, and we still have some residual uh, surround on the outside, but we can easily clip that out. And what we do is we generate uh, seam lines automatically. So already that mosaic looks pretty good, but we can take the seam lines and we can really make those fine adjustments. So here we see a close-up on a particular location where maybe we have a brightness issue between two images. So what we can do is we can uh, go into the software, drop some points on along the seam line, and make the seam line just disappear and have the two images blend into each other seamlessly. So these are either capabilities that are, that are available automatically or they can be adjusted, fine-tuned manually to produce the best possible orthomosaic output. So I'd like to show you some results from some recent projects that we've been involved with. So on the left we have a gallery of St. John, New Brunswick. This is a project that we've been working on together with the city of St. John. And we actually published the mosaic. We provided it to the city of St. John. And what they were able to do is to load it into their open data platform. So if you search open data city of St. John, New Brunswick, one of the first things you'll see is a link to this ArcGIS online map. And on the left, what we see is the 1967 imagery. And on the right, we have the ortho imagery from the most recent uh, collections over the city of St. John. So they've created this nice swipe gallery. And you can basically go to any place on the map and look at changes over time. So um, we'll be providing links to all of this uh, presentation and some of these uh, different uh, maps that, that are available within this PowerPoint. So you feel free to explore at a later time. But you can definitely see that the alignment is very accurate in this case. If I go down to the resolution of the data, uh, some of these neighborhoods were not even here at the time, uh, but the alignment is, is obviously very strong here. Looking at another gallery, so here we have the uh, Fairfax County, Virginia. So let me show you that data set. So very similarly, the, the county of Fairfax, which is quite a large county, has published multiple um, dates or mul multiple time periods on their platform. So here you can see all of the different dates that have been processed. And some of these layers have been processed using historical air photo processing technology. So the technology that we developed has been used to process these data sets. And very similarly, I can go down at street level and I can move around and, and swipe and look at changes over time. So here we see some eras that were not developed in 1972 on the left, and on the right we have the most recent ortho photography from the county, uh, Fairfax County. So there's another example. And if I go back, I'd like to show you some other results so the other thing that we can do, because the data is collected in stereo, as you saw when I showed the graphic of the nominal georeferencing, the images are overlapping along track, and they're also overlapping across track. And so that stereo gives us parallax, and from the parallax, we can generate uh, epipolar pairs, and then we can uh, solve for the uh, elevation knowing the x and the y position. So so here what we see on the left is a, is an, is a interpolated uh, elevation model of what we call a digital surface model based on the overlap portion of all of the stereo images. So we can see quite a bit of detail over some uh, some different features here. We have a big stadium and obviously we can see on the right we have the actual uh, stadium itself, uh, some of the different features, some vegetation quite clearly. Uh, we can see individual buildings, uh, really, the nice thing about the historical imagery is if it's scanned at the right resolution and flown at the right scale, um, it's pretty good data. So we can get down to 50 centimeters, uh, sometimes even higher than that, maybe 20, 20 centimeters with uh, 5,000 scale photography. The most common scale that we see is 15,000 scale, 
uh, photography. There, there are some at 25,000 or more, but typically it's kind of like 10 to 15,000 is the most common scale. So that's an example of a DSM. Here's another example of a DSM that's been extracted from stereo overlapping pairs. So this is a historical a digital surface model that gives us the record of the buildings and the vegetation and all of the information within this image. And within our software, we can filter the surface features off and retain the terrain. So this is actually very important for achieving the highest level of accuracy for the ortho imagery is to use the terrain from the actual imagery because that is reflective of the actual terrain that was there when the photos were collected. So we actually like to produce this layer when we make the ortho imagery uh, in our software. Now this, when we filter these uh, buildings, obviously if we do a difference map between the surface map, the digital surface model and the digital terrain model, then we can get normalized elevations. So for example, we can get building heights, we can get vegetation heights. So this is just information that's available in the data that is now uh, accessible because we've processed it and we've made it available in this GIS ready format. So just speaking of accuracy for a minute, so we've done a number of independent accuracy assessments and the process that we typically use is we collect uh, a well distributed set of points across a data set uh, over features that are present on both the archive imagery and the new imagery that we've used either for reference or the new vectors that we've used as a reference. And so here what we see is a, uh, our RMSC assessment. We're using 10 points well distributed across an entire data set. And you can see the residuals are low. They're typically below one meter. And the RMSC is below one meter. So this was quite a good project. We were able to get good reference imagery. We were able to distribute GCPs across the data set. And we actually used the DEM from the data to produce the orthos. Therefore, the accuracy is quite high. So those are really the factors that affect the accuracy of the ortho correction for the uh, historical air photos. Um, so typically what we've seen is uh, five meters or better is, is, is usually achievable, but we, we definitely try to get uh, one meter or better accuracy. So HAP services. So basically everything that I've just presented to you in terms of software is what we would use internally to process the data on your behalf and essentially the uh, need to learn the software, the need to um, troubleshoot and you know basically work with these difficult data sets goes away um, and and we basically take over and offer that as a service to you now what we do need is we need the scanned stereo photos and if if the photos are not scanned already we do have ways of uh, scanning the photos for you so we can come to your facility or we can hire someone to come to your facility and scan the photos um, we typically need some metadata information like the scale of the photography, the approximate altitude, the focal length of the camera, the approximate scene centers for every photo. Even flight line information is typically um, good enough. We, we can make do with that. And then we also need some reference imagery or vectors and an external DEM to collect GCPs and, uh, and tie points. Um, so th those are not absolutely required in all cases. Uh, sometimes there are places in the world where reference imagery and reference vectors are sort of more readily available than, than other parts of the world. Uh, but so, for example, within the U.S., the digital ortho quad or the NAPE imagery is pretty much available across the intercontinental U.S. So we can use that as a reference. Uh, vector data sets are normally easy to come by as well within Canada and the U.S., um, so basically what we deliver is we deliver the ortho imagery, the mosaic and color, the color balanced mosaic. As I mentioned, typically the uh, RMS error is, is within five meters or less. We can also deliver a digital surface model and a digital terrain model. And another thing that we can deliver, which is 
really important is we can actually give you the exterior orientation. So the final orientation once we've applied the math model so that you can then take the uh, epipolar images, which we also provide, and you can view them in a 3D stereo environment and do advanced 3D feature extraction. So those are typically the deliverables that we would provide. And we handle these like uh, professional services contracts. So we would basically send you a proposal. We would discuss with you over the phone what your requirements are. And then we would um, uh, obtain a, a contract with your organization, take delivery of the uh, scanned imagery or send someone to scan, do the processing, and then deliver the final products to you. And that can be achieved typically within a few weeks, depending on the size of the project, of course. So that's a quick summary of the uh, offering, both the software and the service. So I would like to ask you now, based on what you've seen and what you know about what it is that we're offering, which one you're potentially interested in. Or we'd like to kind of understand whether people are more interested in kind of doing it themselves, if they have the ability to uh, process the data, uh, or maybe uh, this is just uh, something that doesn't warrant the, the, the actual uh, skill building internally to, to use the software and uh, you'd like to do it as a service. I'll be showing some um, resources that are available for, for the software learning uh, at the end of the presentation. We do have some courses available. We also have some um, tutorials and sample data sets. Uh, again, we, we've been lucky to work with the City of St. John and what they've provided to us uh, for your use, for your benefit, is uh, the ability to work with some of their data, both their recent orthophotography as well as the uh, uh, imagery that, that they've scanned and they've made available. So you could, you could pick that up and you can learn how to use the software. So I'm going to leave that open for just a few more seconds. Looks like the majority have voted. So I'm just going to count down from three. So three, two, one. Thank you. So moving on to an important aspect of this topic, which is uh, data dissemination. So. Um, as I mentioned at the outset of the presentation, the ability to take the processed data and to publish it, whether it's to your internal organization or to your external um, citizens of your city or the world uh, through the web, then uh, it's typically pretty easy to do that. So uh, yesterday, I basically knew nothing about Mapbox and I was able to follow a tutorial and take some of the sample data from the city of St. John. And uh, I was able to use their API to publish a map on my own personal server. So this is actually my, uh, this is not PCI server, it's my own server. And uh, I was able to create the data and publish it to the web. So let me show it to you. I have it up here on the screen. So here I was able to uh, basically pull up Mapbox and draw a satellite base map. This is the free data that Mapbox has been able to collect over the years and make available through their platform. And then what I did is I created a tile set and I linked it to this web map, which I published for 1967. So that's the 67 data that you see on the screen right now. We've also processed the 1982 data for the city of St. John. So let me turn that on next. And then the reference imagery that was provided to us from the city of St. John to do the image correction was from 2004. So let me turn that on now. So you can see that um, very easily I was able to basically publish these layers and make them available and make this nice interface that allows me to sort of pan and zoom and turn layers on and off and to be able to inspect specific changes that are occurring. So if I look, for example, at uh, 67 versus current day or versus 2004, I can see some pretty major changes. Over here, a lot of development and uh, some roads that have gone in and uh, quite a few changes. For example, this, this whole highway here wasn't there in 1967. 
and I can turn on 82 and see if that was there in 82 and, and so on. So very easy to publish to Mapbox, quite a nice platform. So if you're interested in that, I encourage you to go check it out. Um, another possibility is commercial tools, so like fully commercial tools. So ArcGIS Online, they have a very nice interface and they've been able to uh, uh, really make it easy for a user that doesn't have any development experience using APIs and so on to basically take a raster data set, drop it into ArcGIS, and then publish a web scene, which is what this is. So I'll just uh, go, go and navigate to that particular scene here. And uh, you can see that uh, the, uh, the data set, let me just open up a new browser here. Oh, I had it here. Here we go. So yeah, so this this is basically a, a 3D scene, and it was very easy. I, I what I did is I actually took the digital surface model, and I draped it on top of the ortho imagery that I corrected, and then I published that as a layer. So you can see if I zoom out, those are the images that have been corrected. That is the extent of the DSM, which is of course only available over the uh, overlap portion of the data set and uh, I was able to publish that pretty easily. And ArcGIS has a nice kind of 3D uh, tilt, pan, and zoom capability in, in, in this interface. So that's that was pretty easy. Uh, within ArcGIS, add the layer, uh, make a web scene, go to ArcGIS Online, publish that as a web scene. Pretty straightforward, very easy to do. Um, so, just talking a little bit more now about applications. So what can this data actually be used for? So let's go through a few different scenarios here. I mentioned the ability to um, generate elevation models because the data is flown in stereo. And if all of the scans are provided, the stereo scans are provided, it really makes for a much richer data set. So here what we have is the uh, data has been corrected using historical air photo processing software, so our, our HAP software. And what we've done is we've provided that to our partners. So DATM is a, a software company based in Anchorage, Alaska. And what they've done is they've taken our epipolar pairs and they're able to ingest that data into a 3D feature extraction platform, a, a, a really rich uh, platform known as uh, Summit Evolution. So on the right, you see the anaglyph that's displayed. So if you have red and green glasses now, you can put them on and have a look. You'll see that the buildings pop up and uh, maybe some of the vegetation as well. And you'll see some of the elevated uh, roads uh, along the edge of this cliff. There's, there's quite a steep cliff here. And uh, over here on the left, what we see is they've actually uh, so DATM has actually spent some time to extract some of these features in 3D. So they've created 3D uh, polygon features of this building. Now this building is no longer present today. Um, I'll go to the next slide and you'll see that. So here is uh, ArcGIS. So I pulled up ArcGIS and I put the base map image on. And you can see that it's, it's basically a vacant parking lot. And if I drape the, the imagery on top of that, you can see that there was a building indeed there. And that 3D polygon that was extracted from uh, Summit can be draped on top of this uh, 3D scene within ArcGIS. So you can see that um, very easily we can use the stereo data to do feature extraction, 3D feature extraction, which can be useful for uh, lots of different applications. So if we switch to the 2D feature extraction world, um, within PCI, we do have the ability to, obviously with the corrected imagery, run lots of different algorithms to do image analysis. One of the newest capabilities that's available to Geomatica users is the object-based image analysis capability. We have a tool called Object Analyst. And what I've done is I've used some historical imagery that was corrected and the digital surface model. So you can see the kind of the light blue uh, color just underneath these red polygons. That represents the elevated buildings here. And those buildings can be 
uh, we can we can extract the polygons. So we can do the segmentation. So what, what we have here is we have automatic segmentation. These are not hand drawn. These are automatically extracted as polygons through a process known as segmentation. And then we can attribute those polygons with the elevation from the digital surface model. And then we can classify those features as buildings above X height, for example. So in this case, I think these buildings are roughly 10 or 15 meters above the ground. And we can classify those and pull those features automatically. So that's just an example of 2D feature extraction. Another example of an application is environmental remediation. So uh, we've been working with a company in Nevada known as Terra Spectra. They're doing some very important work with um, the Navajo Nation and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. So I've put some links here on the screen. You can go read those articles uh, once we send the presentation around. But basically, throughout the Navajo Nation, there was significant mining of uranium from 1944 to 1986. So this is during the time of uh, the development of uh, nuclear weapons. And so the need for raw uranium was, uh, was very important. There were a number of companies that mined these locations, and th this is one location, uh, and, and extracted uranium. The issue is that a lot of those mine sites were not properly uh, reclaimed or put back into the environment in, in a responsible way so as to reduce the potential contaminants flowing into the waterways. Here we see some of the rivers um, that, that are in the river valleys. So obviously the mining which is occurring uh, in a lot of cases on the tops of these uh, elevated, elevated uh, geological features, the uranium was left exposed and so through surface water runoff and so on a lot of those contaminants uh, leaching into the local water supply and so the environmental protection agency has been spending a lot of time and effort with companies like terra spectra to understand what was there in the past and so using the historical imagery uh, these uh, these types of analyses can be done to understand what type of remediation was actually done versus what was claimed. And, and so who's paying the bill and how are uh, the people who are suffering from the health consequences related to the pollution um, is obviously a, a critical factor. So it's a very interesting case of uh, the use of historical imagery in this, in, in this particular uh, scenario. Another example is uh, this is an example from the city of St. John when when the city amalgamated. So when they when they took all the different cities and put them into one big giant city, there was essentially a bylaw that said that if you had a private dwelling on the road at that time, you were entitled to to, to receive services such as uh, in Canada uh, we have snow clearing services, we have road maintenance, we have garbage removal, this kind of thing. All of those services are available to. Uh, dwellings that were located on specific roads. So using the historical imagery, the city of St. John was actually able to go back and look and and uh, essentially tell the homeowners that uh, despite the fact that they have been getting these services, they're no longer entitled to them because their dwelling was not present during that time. So it's an example of a bylaw that's in place that uh, cities can enforce or uh, better understand uh, what, what's being done uh, in current day and by going back through the archives. So this can have a monetary uh, benefit for the city, obviously, if they're able to offload the service provision to some of these private roads to the individuals who live on those roads. Um, another example is uh, here in Ottawa. So um, the uh, historical imagery can be used to do geological interpretation. In this case, what we see is a map that was created uh, through borehole sampling. So essentially, a series of uh, ge geologists here in Ottawa collected uh, borehole samples over multiple locations across the city to understand the potential risk in if there was an earthquake or if there's any kind of movement on the ground to the infrastructure that's in place and to people's private dwellings. So we can see here that one particular year in 2012, there was a severe drought 
and uh, people in Ottawa um, had issues with their foundations cracking. And the reason for that is because of this type of lita clay, this quick uh, glacial marine clay uh, kind of moving around. So the whole point is that despite the fact that um, this analysis was done with boreholes, the presence of historical imagery makes it possible to use photo interpretation skills to understand the landscape. So for the city of Ottawa, it's important to, um, to, to, to defend itself in a way, to, to be able to tell residents that in fact they did provide permits to developers over areas where they, th they believe that the, the glacial marine clay was not likely to be present. So here we see an image over one of these suburban areas in Ottawa from 1958. This is a layer that's available online on the City of Ottawa's mapping portal. And if we change to 2017, current day, we can see a lot of development has occurred over those particular locations. So being able to go back in time and to look at the landscape before the dwellings were built is an important part of understanding the geological formations and to be able to uh, ensure that permitting was provided where it made the most sense to develop uh, housing in this particular case. So with that, I want to ask you one more poll. So having seen some of those applications, I would like to uh, better understand maybe what types of applications you're interested in. Um, so I've listed a few different applications here, environmental assessment or remediation, uh, planning, change detection in general, and, and, and uh, uh, that could be a number of different things. Uh, perhaps it's mining related, or maybe it's urban expansion or land development. Um, so it'd be interesting to hear what uh, people have been done. If you do have um, a, 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 an interesting application that you've seen, by all means, please type it in the questions box and um, that would be interesting to see what, what people have been doing with the data. So I'm just going to leave that open for a little bit longer. It looks like most people have been able to weigh in on this question. And I'm going to close this down in three, two, one. And I'm going to share the results. So it looks like, uh, so in, in this case, there was no right answer. It's more, uh, you know, you, 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 could, you could vote for more than one, so the percentages don't make sense. But uh, it looks like change detection in general. Maybe people aren't sure what they're going to do with it, but they know that obviously looking at changes is, is important environmental assessment slash remediation and uh, urban expansion and land development. So interesting to, to see what people are doing with the data or interested in doing with the data if, if it was available. So just a few more slides before I open up for questions. The, uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, there are quite a few training materials available. The most important one, I would say, or the most uh, uh, easy to consume and, and pleasant to, to work with, I would say, is uh, the specific course that we created. So we use a, uh, a learning management system uh, called Udemy, which is a, a free uh, platform where you can publish training courses. And so we've, we've published, we've actually published four different courses there. This is one of the courses. So you can go to udemy.com, search up historical air photo processing, uh, the link is on the on the screen right now. And basically, we provide you with everything you need. You have the high-resolution scans from the city of St. John. You have the reference imagery from 2004, the scene centers, the road center lines, the uh, reference elevation model. And with the use of Geomatica HAP module, then you can obviously work with the data, work with the software, you can follow along. So it's it's like a series of instructional videos. Each clip is about sort of five to 10 minutes long, and there's roughly sort of an hour and a half of material to go through, and uh, we walk you through a complete data set from, from A to Z. So that's a great resource to, uh, to look up. And with that, I 
encourage you to contact us if you're interested in the software, if you're interested in services, just shoot us an email, info at pcigmatics.com, and uh, let us know what you're interested in doing. And I'm going to leave that up on the screen. And I'm going to open up the questions panel, which I haven't even looked at yet. So um, if you have questions, by all means, please type them in. So um, I'm just going to read some of the questions and uh, go ahead and uh, do my best here to answer them live. So one of the questions is, uh, can HAP work with aerials without a camera report? So one of the things that we mentioned in terms of the requirements was uh, the need to uh, essentially have uh, focal length and uh, approximate flying height and so on. So we've actually dealt with a number of data sets where this information is not available, and we're able to work around it. So for example, um, if we know where the data was collected by uh, for which government agency, sometimes there's historians who will tell us um, through an article that they've published that it was an RC8 camera that was used. Uh, Spartan Air was the company that flew the data, for example. So we're able to kind of do some detective work and find out that way. But we have other tricks up our sleeves. We, we have ways of kind of troubleshooting the data and estimating the focal length and estimating the altitude and the scale and so on. And we're able to, to keep the project going. So that, that's not an absolute requirement. It is nice to have it, but we can still get around it um, if, we, if we need to. Uh, we have a question about, can the software consume GPS-based ground control points? So I'm going to assume that what the, uh, the person means by this is surveyed ground control points. So absolutely we can. We have the ability to uh, pull up the image, pick a point on the image, and assign the surveyed control point uh, value, both the X, Y, and the Z of that surveyed control point. And that is definitely one of the ways in which we can improve the accuracy and provide information to the, uh, to the data. Um, there's a question about scanning. So do you have any recommendations for scanner hardware for these projects? So we have done some work on that. And really, it comes down to uh, whether you're working with contact prints or if you're working with film rolls. So I'm, I'm probably going to assume that you're working with contact prints if you're thinking of buying a scanner because a film roll scanner is on the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So uh, um, we, um, we, we've seen uh, people use uh, the Epson 11,000 XL. So the main thing is um, to get a scanner that allows for wider than eight and a half inches wide. So the typical scanners don't go wider than eight and a half inches. So if you get something that's a little bit wider, it's going to cost a little bit more, like three or four thousand dollars, but it's going to allow you to scan sort of the bigger contact prints. Um, questions are piling in now, so I'm going to try to get through as many as I can here. We have a question about the force stand changing and to create DSM from different periods. Uh, I can use this to predict how annual growth timber changes. So I think it's a comment more than a question, but I agree. The comment is about uh, generating DSMs and assessing vegetation growth over forest stands. So uh, I agree that is something that could be done. Uh, another question on the accuracy of the center points, so the estimated center points of the data. Uh, really, the accuracy doesn't need to be that high. Uh, what we do in, in when we start the project is we relax the requirements for uh, matching the points. So we can go kind of as, as far away as one or two kilometers, um, and, and we'll, we'll match a rough number of points to be able to start to bring the data close to where it belongs. So a question about the possibility to use globally available DMs in the HAP process if external DM is not locally available. Um, definitely, uh, we are able to use external DEMs. In fact, we normally use 
SRTM, for example, to at least collect elevation for the ground control and the tie points to improve the accuracy of the model. So we, uh, we do have the ability to use external DEMs that are freely available, um, such as SRTM. The issue with the DEM is when you go to produce the ortho photo, if you're using a coarse DEM like a like a SRTM, which is at uh, 90 meters or 30 meters, then obviously if you have a high relief, like a steep terrain, you're going to get some displacement when you're projecting those pixels onto the ground. So that's where it's actually better to, uh, to uh, use the elevation data that's contained in the stereo overlap of the photos themselves to produce the orthos. Um, we have a question about scanning analog photos, um, optimum resolution. So um, I, I believe that sort of the optimal resolution at which you start to create noise in your data is somewhere in the neighborhood of 800 DPI. So, um, so that's typically, if you kind of go beyond that, you're, you're, you're creating uh, noise in the data. So that is important to keep that in mind. Uh, we do have a paper available on our website on that, a very detailed paper that was written by some scientists at Natural Resources Canada. So we'll be sure to provide that link. Um, there, there, there's a series of experiments that have been done with scanning, and uh, and, and they've, they've arrived at these conclusions using uh, us, using actual uh, results from, from different projects. Um, a question about... Uh, Correcting corona imagery. I think this is a really cool application uh, for those of you who aren't familiar. The corona data is the the uh, uh, spy uh, image, the spy satellites that were flying during the uh, sort of the Cold War, um, and a lot of that data is available. And uh, yes, absolutely, it could could be used for for that. And so. Um, we have a question about if historical photos have inadequate overlap to drive a DM for ortho rectifying, is it possible to use a historical topo map to get a DM for ortho rectifying? If not, how else can it be done? So I would say yes, but probably the topo map, uh, if the, the, the preferred method would be to at least get the vector contours from the topo map so that you, we can convert that to an actual interpreted uh, elevation model. So that, that, that is a possibility. We, we can create a, a, a model from the uh, contour lines for sure. Um, uh, doo -doo -doo. Someone's asking about using the trial version of HAP in a paper, if you're publishing a paper. No problem. Um, do get in touch with me preferably. Uh, I'm the director of marketing, so I'd love to talk about the fact that you're using our software. That would be fantastic. And uh, yeah, just get in touch with me. The There's a question about do we use geographic or projected coordinates? Uh, doesn't matter. We can work with any coordinate system. Um, it, it, it's easy to sort of move around with the different projection systems within our software. Very easy to do. Uh, a limit on the number of images that can be processed at a time. Um, so um, we're in this presentation, we talked about desktop software. We do have enterprise software that can parallelize ortho generation, mosaic creation, all that kind of thing. So we are limited to a single license uh, in this case. Um, but um, we're, 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 it's pretty feasible to process a lot of data in, in a short amount of time. Uh, the, the most challenging part of processing historical imagery we found is to create everything that you need to get started. So uh, roughly approximating where the scenes are, making sure that the scans are good quality and uh, making sure that everything is, uh, is properly set up before. And so we uh, have a lot of other questions, but I think that's all the time I'm going to take. Um, I would like to sincerely thank you for being here today. I, I uh, hope that you uh, have learned a little bit about uh, what's possible with historical imagery. It's certainly a topic that we're very passionate about here at PCI. We uh, are, are just uh, um, really thrilled at the fact that we can apply modern-day technology to correct these old air photos 
and really preserve the heritage that's contained in the in the historical uh, photography. So we'd love to work with you uh, either by providing you the software and the training or to provide you a service if that's what you're interested in doing. So thanks for being here. Presentation is going to be sent around as well as a recording of the webinar. Have a great day, everyone. Signing off. Thanks a lot.